Welcome to Signs and Wonders Gospel Ministries. I'm your host, Apostle Connie Kessner, and today our teaching is on being lost. More importantly, not just that you're lost, but how, how do you get found? How can you be found? We're going to look into God's love for sinners. Now, before we get into the Word of God, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever been lost? Well, sure, everybody's been lost probably at some time or another. Um, I've been lost driving before. I've been lost in a little bit where I've just missed an exit. I remember one time several years ago, I was driving around, I was trying to get out of D.C., and there was a lot of, uh, of road construction, and I was lost for two hours. Couldn't, I, I added another two hours to my trip home because I had gotten lost. But I can tell you, um, you know, there's varying degrees of being lost. Um, but I can share with you one time when I was when I was five years old I, I literally got lost I was at the I was at Ocean City Maryland with my family on vacation and my teenage sister was put uh, was supposed to be watching me however my teenage sister thought that it was more fun to watch teenage boys than it was to look after her baby sister so I ended up getting lost you know, one thing about being at the beach, everything looks the same. The water becomes mesmerizing as the ocean comes in, the current and, and the sand, and the, everything just kind of looks the same. And I remember being lost, and I could not find anybody I knew. I couldn't find my sisters. I couldn't find my mom and dad. And I remember I was really young. I had this red flotation device around me that was, uh, you know, one of those rings, but it had a head on it that was, uh, it was a dragon, and I called it Tippy. And I just thought Tippy was the greatest thing, and Tippy and I were lost. And uh, we, uh, I remember walking down the beach with these big crocodile tears crying, hoping that somebody would find me, that my parents would find me, or my sister, one of my sisters would find me. And I kept saying, Tippy, it's going to be okay. They're going to find us. They're going to find us. And eventually, the lifeguard uh, found me and took me back to my parents. And I remember grabbing a hold of my mom and holding her so tight. I was so glad to be found because it was scary to be five years old and lost at the beach. It was a scary thing. And I was, I was lost for a good little while, and, uh, but getting found was very, is very exciting. Um, so today we're going to look. Jesus talked in, in three different parables about something or something that was lost. So if you have your Bibles at home and you want to follow along, we're going to begin reading in Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse number 1. It says, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. See, Jesus is teaching here that 
He is looking for those who are lost. He, he will leave 99 behind. See, maybe in, in today's society, especially living here in America, not many of us are sheep farmers, and we don't really know about sheep. But see, a shepherd who had lost one sheep cared so much about his flock that he would be willing to leave 99 that were in good standing, that were right in the place where they needed to be, to go look for that one missing one that was lost. A good shepherd would not just say, hmm, well, I got, still have 99, and not take the time to go look for the one that was lost. And see, that's how Jesus is with us. When we're lost, when we're lost from him and we cannot find our way to him, he is looking for us. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. You know that if you're lost and you don't know Christ, he is looking for you? That's a pretty good thing, that the creator of the universe is looking for you. He says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. See, the heavens rejoice. When one person, one soul gets saved, there's a party going on in heaven. The heavens begin to rejoice. Jesus is teaching us here in this next parable. He says, Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I have lost. See, the coin was of value to the woman. She was willing to, 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 to turn everything upside down in her home in order to find it. Now, see, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I have lost more things in my home that I wanted to keep in safekeeping. Have you ever done this? Thought, hmm, I have got this thing, and I, I want to make sure I don't lose it, so I place it in a certain location. And then I begin to think about it. Hmm, maybe there's a better location. So I make, take it from that location and move it to yet another location. And then my brain begins to work a little bit more, and I say, hmm, that one's not good. And so I move it. I end up moving it several times. And then times, time goes by, months, maybe years, and I go to look for that thing that I wanted to keep in a very special place. And I go to look at the first place that I put it, and I can't find it. And I begin frantic to be looking. And this has happened to me time and time again. I have spent more time looking for things that I put in what I thought was a safe place. And see, that's how Jesus is with us. He looks high and low. He's come to seek and save that which is lost. See, you have value to Jesus. He values your soul. Jesus came, and when he died on that cross, he bore all of your sins all of my sins, so that you can no longer be lost. All it takes is a matter of repentance and to say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. And again, here in verse number 10, it says, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. See, that's pretty exciting. When, when you get saved, when you become born again, see, it's not just something that happens to you. It's such an exciting moment that the angels in heaven are rejoicing. All of heaven is abuzz and rejoicing joyfully that you're no longer lost. Then we come into the, the bulk of the story here where he talks about the prodigal son. And in verse number 11, it says, And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Now, here we find, have, a, have a man who has two sons. And the younger one is saying, I want my inheritance now. You know, we normally, we got to wait for an inheritance. If our parents leave us something in their will, we get it after they pass away, not while they're still alive. So th this is really a selfish request that the younger son is making to his father. And, you know, for many years, this verse kind of troubled me. I thought, what kind of father would give their son, their child, their inheritance before they died. And one day, because I know for, for a fact, if I had asked my own father before he passed away, Dad, 
give me half of my, or give me a third of my inheritance because I have two sisters. That would not have flown. He would have said, no, I can tell you that right now. But as I began to, to ponder on this, the Lord began to show me. See, as, as born-again believers, as sons and daughters of Christ, we can partake of our inheritance right now, right away. We have the ability, once we get saved, we are partakers of our inheritance. We have righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. We not only have salvation, but we have deliverance. We have healing. We have love, mercy, grace. We have so many things. We have all the things that the kingdom of God offers us available to us today. As soon as we repent. We don't have to wait to get to heaven in order to partake of those things. So this young boy, this man, had two sons, and the younger one gets this idea, Dad, give me half of, half of your estate. Give me my inheritance right now. And in verse number 13, it says, uh, so, the, so the man divided his wealth, it says in, number, in verse number 12, and it says in verse 13, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, I find it very interesting. It says, in, in not many days. So this man was, this man was, uh, uh, this young son, he didn't wait very long. It says that he gathered everything together. He did not leave in his home a robe a pair of sandals. It says he took everything he had. He was not planning on returning home. Something had to have happened with his relationship with his father that he wanted to sever all ties with him. Dad, give me, give me the, my portion of the estate so I can get out of here. I, and so it, it tells us here that he went on a journey into a distant country. See, the kid didn't just move down the street or across town or even into another place another place in the same country. It says that he moved to a distant country. He was getting as far away as he could from his father. And it says there he squandered his estate with loose living. I believe it's the King James Version says he, he, he spent it on riotous living. He blew his money on partying, prostitutes, drugs, alcohol. You know, he's the life of the party. He's down at the local pub. He's buying drinks for everyone. But then in verse number 14, it says, now when he had spent everything. See, this guy, according to the world, had it all. And in a short amount of time, he lost it all. It said, when he spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So it, not only is he out of money, but he's living in a time, the country he's living in, it has, has famine going on. There, there, there's little food to eat. So he not only has no, no money, he doesn't have anything to eat. And it says in verse 15, So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. So he finally gets a job, but here this young Jewish boy has to go feed the swine. See, the pigs were considered unclean to the Jews. This was a very humiliating job, a very humiliating thing for this young boy to have to do. And yet he's desperate. He's out of money. He has no food to eat. And here he is in the pig pen. He was probably so far down, the only place he had to look was up. Have you ever been in a situation where everything has been taken from you. Every, your, your world suddenly changes, and maybe you've lost your job, or maybe you've, um, your situation has changed, and all of a sudden maybe you get divorced, and maybe you were cert used to live in a certain lifestyle, and all of a sudden things change. Your house gets foreclosed. Your bank accounts get emptied. And you have nothing, and you're wondering where you're going to get your next meal. That's where this boy was. And it says in verse 16, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. See, he was on his own. Nobody was giving him a handout. He wasn't on welfare. He wasn't getting food stamps. He wasn't standing in line at the local church, at the local church food pantry. 
It says no one was giving him anything. And you know what? He was hungry. It says he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods. He was filling them with the carob pods that the, that the pigs were eating. Verse 17, it says, but when he came in, came to his senses. See, that's when things begin to turn around. He came to his senses and said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger? All of a sudden, he begins to realize that in my father's house, even the servants have food to eat. Even the servants have a place to lay their head. Even the servants are not stuck out in the pig pen with nothing to eat. Hmm. He says in verse 18, I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. See, this was the best idea this kid had in the whole story. See, when we, when we acknowledge sin in our life, that's our first step. That's our first step to getting from going from being lost to being found. It says in verse 20, so he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. I love that verse. That is such a powerful verse. See, this son had squandered his father's inheritance, this inheritance that his father gave him. He moved so far away. God, uh, father, I don't want to see you anymore. I'm going to take all my stuff, and I'm not just moving out of, out, of, out of your house. I'm moving out of the country, into a distant country. And all the things that the, that the boy had done against his father... The father was waiting for him. The father saw him when he was a long way off. And it says he ran and embraced him and kissed him. Notice the father didn't say, oh, here comes that rotten son of mine and storm in the house and slam the door and lock it up and say, go away. It says he ran. The father ran to the son. You know, in this story, the father represents our heavenly father. And we are, the, we are the prodigals. We're the ones who've strayed. We're the ones who have, have not uh, always walked with him. This prodigal son all of a sudden gets the revelation. Here I am, hungry. I have no job. I have, I have nothing. I have no money. But even in my father's house, the servants, the lowest of the low, get fed. They have a place to sleep. They can rest in, the, in, the, in my father's house. See, he says this, and the father is so excited. And as soon as the father embraces him and kisses him, it says, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he gets the chance to say, hire me as your servant, the father says in verse 22, but the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. See, this was very significant. The father was saying, you're my child. You've always been my child, even though you've wandered away, even though you've done things against me and against heaven. I'm still your father. This house still belongs to you. All that I have is yours. Get the best robe and place it on him. He was covering, with, covering him with righteousness. Put a ring on his finger. Represented the signet ring of the family. You're still part of this family. And sandals on his feet. See, sandals, shoes represented uh, people. If you didn't have shoes, it represented you lived in poverty. Father says, bring out the sandals. And it says in verse 23, and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. 
Oh, what a time of rejoicing. See, that's how God is. When we stumble away from him, when we're not walking in his perfect will, and all of a sudden we come to our senses and say, God, I'm sorry. See, once we repent and say, Lord, he opens up his heart, he opens up his heart, arms to us. The angels in heaven begin to rejoice when we get born again, when we begin to walk in the ways of the Lord. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Remember what I said earlier? Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. If you don't know Jesus, you're lost. And he's looking for you. In verse number 25, it says, Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. Hey, this is my house. What's going on here? It sounds like a party. There's music going on. There's people laughing. There's people rejoicing and celebrating. Why wasn't I told that this was going to happen? Why wasn't I told? about this party and that's what he's asking the servant in verse 27 the servant said to him your your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound verse 28 but he became angry he became angry see not everybody is going to celebrate your salvation not everybody is going to celebrate your return to the lord not everybody is going to celebrate your relationship with Heavenly Father. That doesn't matter, because it says here in verse 28, but he, beca he became angry, and he was not willing to go in, and his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. See, he's all of a sudden, he begins to get jealous. All of this is vented up, not all of a sudden getting jealous, but he begins to express his jealousy. Because I'm sure this had been festering with him for some time. I'm the one who's always stayed with you. I'm the one who's always done anything you've ever asked of me. Any command you've done, whether I liked it or agreed with it, I've done it. I've never questioned you. But you've never even killed a goat and had a celebration, a party for me. See, the, this boy, this older son, he's looking at himself instead of looking at what had happened to his, his, his younger brother. And in verse 30 it says, but when this son of yours came, see, he, he says, when this son of yours came, he doesn't even say my brother. He refers to him as this son of yours. See, he's very angry. When this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf. See, he, he, the, the, the older uh, brother is mad. He's angry. Why do you do all these things? This kid is, has, has squandered all your wealth, and, and he squandered it on prostitutes and loose living. He's been drinking and partying and blew all this money. And I've been here all this time. And the father said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. Remember I told you that the father represents God? He says, all that, I ha all that is mine is yours. See, we can partake of everything in the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost. Forgiveness, mercy, grace, love, faithfulness, salvation, healing, deliverance. All these things are yours. They're mine if you say yes to the kingdom of God. But we, have, we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. See, God's the only one who can take that which is lost and make it found. See, God's the only one who can take that which is dead and breathe life back into it. He's the one who just gathered dust from the ground and blew into it and created man. He's the giver of life. 
See, maybe you're in a situation where you've, you've, you, you, may, you maybe have it all. Maybe if the world is looking at you, you've got, got a great home, you've got, uh, you've got cars, you've got family, you've got money, you have everything that you could possibly need. But you find there's something in your life that is lacking. You find that there's something that's keeping you from something that, that, that is missing. See, that's God. You need Jesus in your life. Maybe you've done so many bad things and you're, you're like the, the prodigal son who's so far down that you can only look up. And you know there's something missing, but you cannot seem to place what that something is. Friends, I'm telling you, you need Jesus in your life. You, you need Jesus to, uh, to come and fill your life. That's why I came. If you ask many Christians, you know, why did Jesus come? And they'll, they'll give you a pat answer of, Jesus came to die on the cross to save me from my sins. Yeah, Jesus came. He died on the cross. He, he, he came and saved us from our sins. But he not only did that, but he brought a kingdom. See, when you have a personal relationship with Jesus, when you become born again, you automatically become a son or a daughter of Christ. You begin to walk into the kingdom of God. You need healing, it's yours. You need deliverance, it's yours. See, there's freedom that only comes through knowing Christ. He's the one who can take something dead and breathe life into it. You know, I got saved when I was about six years old. And I, I walked in the ways of the Lord till I was in my late teens, early 20s. And all of a sudden, I began to believe the lies of the enemy. And I became that prodigal daughter. And I, all of a sudden, I, I got to a point in my life where I had to say, God, I'm sorry. I want to come back home. And, and God was doing the exact same thing he does in this story. He ran and embraced me and kissed me. See, God wants to embrace you, hug you, kiss you with intoxicating kisses. He wants to bring you into the kingdom of God. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That's all you have to do is say, God, I believe. Jesus is the Son of God. And if that's you today and you want to say, Jesus, just say this short prayer with me. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I repent of my sins. I repent of my ways. And I invite you to come and live inside of me. I want to walk in your ways. I want you to be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer and you sincerely meant it. The Bible says that the angels in heaven are rejoicing, and they're rejoicing right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you next time. Amen. Mm -hmm.